Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room. I do have another sewing project for you all today. Basically, I'm going to be walking you through how I make my Italian Renaissance inspired sleeve nonsense ensembles. Um, so I've included a couple of these in my different lookbooks here on the channel now, and I've been, I've been making this style for a couple of years now. Uh, it was originally inspired by the show, the TV show The Borgias. I just like fell in love with all the epic sleeves going on for the costumes for that show, and I wanted to try something similar, obviously fusing it with my more 1950s mid-century style. And this was actually the first dress I ever came up with. It's a little tight on me that that uh, brocade doesn't stretch at all, and you can kind of see that here. But I really was happy with how the sleeves came out, so I've been working with the same kind of style for several years now. But the version of this Italian Renaissance inspired situation I'll be showing you today is going to be the princess bodice vest thing with the lacing in the back, and then how I do these separate little weird sleeve sections over that. And then they're like kind of left empty, and you wear a peasant blouse underneath it, and that's like where the poofs come in. And I'll show you, hopefully, I'll show you that in the modeling clips at the end of this as well. But before any of the modeling can happen, we have to get started, so let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom as usual. So we have this little like bodice here, it's sort of supposed to be again sort of vaguely Renaissance or early Tudor inspired in shape. Um, I don't put any boning in these except along the lacing. So I had one that was front lacing, I put boning along the lacing there and then the ones that lace up the back, I have been putting some boning in the very last um, bit of it where the lacing goes just so that it doesn't get scrunched up and weird. So I'll show you that when we come to it. but. Other than that, this doesn't have any internal structure. It's not built to go over a corsetry. That's why this is, you know, clothes and not a costume or not a historic costume, at least, because I'm not building this to go over historic undergarments. If I were going to actually make a Renaissance or uh, anything, anything from, from the Renaissance to the 19, you know, oh, nine or whatever, I would be making corsetry and stuff to go underneath it. But that's not something that is involved in this. This is just a regular, using my regular dress pattern and wearing like regular foundation garments, 1940s style. Uh, underwear and then trying to have a more historic look to it. So anyway, I'm just gonna be taking my regular bodice block front here and I'm going to use the princess line version of it. So this exact pattern here, you've seen me take away these darts and split it into two pieces along the princess line before. I did it for my um, button front little jacket, twill jackets. I'll put a card up to that video. Um, I talked about doing this same modification, splitting into a princess, a shoulder princess, which is where you, you know, draw a line up through the shoulder and then eliminate these darts in between that style line. Um, I talked about that same thing in my making a Luke Skywalker inspired dress video, so I'll put a card up to that video. And then I also talk a little bit more about princess seams and uh, modifying my princess seam pattern in my vest video. So you can also check that out as well, but I only have so many cards, so I'm not going to link to that one. <laughs> um, this is a basic copy of my princess seamed version of this. So this is just this block turned into a princess seamed front here. Um, you can see this is a two dart bodice, one in this um, under the arm here on the side seam and one in the waist. And those two darts, you can see, it's almost as if the side dart gets split up into the shoulder and you sort of still have almost two darts of fullness that get closed when this seam gets sewn together. I'm not gonna show you how I take this pattern and get this pattern today because I have shown it already two or three times in my other videos. So check out those other videos to see exactly how I get from here to here. Um, just because I don't want to be super, super repetitive. It isn't super difficult, but I would recommend with, this is a, not a major modification, but you know, switching from darts in one piece to two pieces with style lines is a big enough modification that I recommend after you do this, you do test this pattern in um, muslin and see if there's any other modifications or fixes you may need to make just based on what has happened in the transference from here to here. Technically they should fit extremely similar, but in case something went wrong or in case there's a little factor that you have to deal with that you weren't expecting, it's good to test the princess bodice after you construct it out of the normal one. So that out of the way. But how do I go from this two part, you know, shoulder princess front to a little bodice like this? Well, the only difference really is instead of sewing this, you know, along the shoulder to create a wide shoulder and a high neck, I bring this down and I consider that like an edge. So really, you know, this, like so, you can almost kind of see how that quickly starts to look like this. You have this square or rectangular kind of like squared off piece in the front, that squared off neckline. And then instead of getting sewn along 
all the way up to the shoulder, you just have more of a strap because of how this goes like this. So really the only thing you have to do to go from the princess, a uh, shoulder princess bodice to something like this is you just lower the neckline of the front, the center front piece. Um, so this is just showing you this with this, but I will show you my actual pattern that I have been using to make these. So this is the actual, like my pattern from my collection here. You can see all the pin marks from where I've used it that I've been using to make these little bodices. And again, you can see it's very similar. The only difference is that neckline is just lowered. Um, so this, you know, gets sewn all along this line. This gets sewn up to here. And the neckline is actually still quite high. You can see I've added on little bits over the time. So the first one I made was here. And then I said that was too low. And so I added on another like three quarters of an inch and I added on another quarter of an inch last time because I just kept was inching this neckline a little bit higher. That's mostly because if you are wearing a regular bra or something like this, like the edge of the like more triangular shaped bra cup will show in a neckline if you're not high enough. So I've been raising it a little bit higher over the years just to make sure that my bra straps and the top of my, like the triangle shapes of my bra perhaps do not show um, because like the Bali flower bra, which is this one, which is the one I wear with most of my vintage clothing. I have a whole video about vintage style undergarments and what I wear. If you are interested in that, feel free to search that on the channel as well. If you want to know what kind of vintage undergarments I wear or vintage style undergarments I wear, um, <clears throat> but they're kind of full coverage, especially like the, compared to like modern, like demi cup bras and stuff like that. So you have to be conscious of what's going to show. So I've raised this neck up line up a little bit over the years is what I'm trying to freaking say. Um, but this little bit of like gathering here, I'm just imagining the peasanty blouse I'm wearing underneath this outfit, underneath this bodice and sleeves um, is going to poke through or show here along the top. And I'll just arrange it. The way that you can arrange these is like, because this like uh, pencil skirt, the waistband of the skirt here is holding everything in place down at my waist. So this is holding this under tension. So I just tuck it in and zhuzh it around the way I want before I fully lace up the bodice down the back. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to show you that a little bit later on when I am modeling this garment for you. But again, this is a bodice and then upper and lower sleeve. And then everything else, these like little puffs you see here is all part of that same peasant t-shirt that just gets worn underneath this. Um, so this is a one, two, three piece like little uh, bodice and sleeve set. And then the shirt underneath is separate. So um, that way I can make this in black and then I can wear a ivory shirt underneath it. I could make a black pesky shirt to be black on black. I could make red, green, whatever I want in the future and change up the look just by changing the peasanty or billowy blouse that I wear underneath this garment. So um, that's the story there. So the front of these little bodice vesty sort of things I make is just these two piece, uh, the shoulder princess, and then the front piece is cut down to the neckline, however low you would like it to be um, or whatever shape you'd like to be. If you wanted this to curve underneath or curve out, like whatever shape you wanted, or even have this be a um, sweetheart neckline. You can do whatever you'd like. Of course, I think the straight across looks the most like Borgia's looking. Um, so that's what I'll be doing again for this one. And I'm gonna be doing again, the center back lacing on this. And so let's go ahead and start talking about what I do for the back of this. So here is my pattern for the back of these little bodices I've been making. Again, this is like my, you can see the pen marks, the exact pattern piece I have been using. And you can see it's virtually a tracing of my back bodice block. Now I could use the princess line version of this where the dart has been eliminated and again, has a shoulder princess. Um, but that in, I've usually am making these uh, quite quickly and I want to do them fast. So I've just been using this one piece for the back with a dart because it doesn't means that I don't have to like, you know, finish the seam. It's less pieces to cut out basically and a little bit less work, I think to just throw a dart in the back piece like this. Really the only difference between this pattern piece and my regular bodice block blouse is the um, neckline up here. So of course, this is the front piece here. I've just marked that and then continued that neckline down and I'm keeping it pretty high up in the back as well here. Um, you could again, come down further if you want to. And again, you could use the princess seamed back if you wanted to and have it be lower like that in the back as well. I recommend having it come up a little further. Uh, I, a, the coverage in the back is kind of nice if you're wearing something with like a bra strap and you don't have to worry about how low it's going and whether or not like it's being covered and things like that. Um, and then also just for the lacing and stuff like that, I think it's better to have a longer area of lacing. It just helps everything lay nicely, I think. So the back is basically the same as my block. So there's really no change there. So this is a very simple pattern for the bodice, but then we come to the sleeves. 
All right, so let me talk you through how I first designed the sleeves for this and then how I've just kept it since then. Back in however many years ago when I first made a dress similar to this one, I devised these sleeve patterns and I've been using the same ones ever since then. So again, this sleeve is technically kind of like three parts. It's the upper sleeve, the lower sleeve, which are attached via ribbon, in my case, usually velvet ribbon, to the bodice. And then underneath this like puppy sleeve is separate. It's part of a blouse that I wear underneath these little bodices. So it's two separate pieces. Again, that is um, that is a more historical way to do it. Like these, the shifts that you see poking out underneath Renaissance dresses like this would have been a separate piece because the linens and things worn close to the body would have been more washable compared to the outside gowns, which would have been virtually unwashable. Um, so, and that's more of a historic thing going on here uh, to have the linen kind of shift worn underneath something. So we have one point for historical accuracy, but very little otherwise. Um, so we need to create the upper and lower sleeve patterns, which are going to look like this upper and lower sleeve pattern here. This side, I put the swoops in. I haven't done it on this side, but we'll get to that in a minute. So how, how do I get this sleeve pattern? Do I take my sleeve block and modify it? No, I have just done these two pieces from scratch. And the way I've done that is to take four different measure, well, six measurements down along my arm. So if this is your arm, this is a little, you know, little hand here trying to draw arms from the side. Not really my forte. Um, so at the top of my bicep underneath my underarm, around my arm, I measure that. That was 13 inches. Down above my elbow, it's 11 and uh, 0.5 inches. Then underneath my elbow, the top of my forearm, it's 10.5 inches. And then down my wrist, it's six and a half inches. Now, imagining after I take those measurements, seeing, you know, where uh, along my arm, I took those, I measure the distance between them. Hopefully that makes sense. So from the top of my arm around, not the top of my shoulder, but top of my arm around to above my elbow kind of area, it was six inches. And then from below my elbow to my wrist, it was seven inches. So that's how I got all these measurements that I'm going to use to draft this two sleeve patterns, really upper and lower sleeve. Now you can have it not have these little puffs in the back if you wanted to, if you wanted to just keep it straight and smooth like I usually do the tops of my sleeves. Um, or I like having these little extra cutouts, which again is a Borgia's inspired situation. And I usually try and do elastic loops on one side and buttons on the other. So I'll put little loops of elastic on the end of these points and then sew buttons to the other points, which I haven't drawn in here, but you get the idea. And I'll sew buttons to them. That way I can just loop this over the button. It's a lot easier to get on by yourself as opposed to putting ribbons on the end of this and then tying them which also looks very pretty, but it's harder to arrange yourself a little bit. So I have these one upper sleeve, lower sleeve, and then they get attached to the bodice with velvet ribbons. You could do this in many ways. You could either have ribbon attached to here and a separate ribbon attached to the bodice and then tie them into bows, which looks more like this, if I can find a picture, hopefully. But usually I just sew, I have like three inch long ribbons or whatever it is, and I sew everything down into place. So it's not as adjustable. Um, a lot of times in Renaissance, like actual Renaissance or Tudor era kind of sleeves, they tie on and you could like wear like say a red velvet bodice with red velvet sleeves, but you could also trade it out for like more elaborate sleeves or slashed sleeves or, um, you know, in gold embroidered sleeves with your red bodice. Like, uh, and it's not like they were mixing and matching that much, but like the idea was that the garments, the more elaborate garments were, took longer to make, were more expensive and you wanted them to be like if your sleeves wore out, but your bodice hadn't or vice versa, like clothes were more precious then. So that's why a lot of the pieces were not necessarily again, mix and match, but made so that they could be worn independent of one another. But how do we get these two upper and lower sleeve patterns using our measurements? So we're gonna draw a center line boop, all the way down, of course, to work with. And so my top bicep measurement is 13 inches. I'm gonna go ahead and add one inch to that for an inch of ease in here, because of course the puffy shirt needs to fit underneath this and you're gonna be moving your arms. You can't have it be skin tight. Um, I'm not using a stretch fabric for this. I'm using a woven fabric. So it's not gonna have any stretch really inherent in it, unless I were to cut this on the bias or something like that or use a stretch fabric, but we're just gonna assume you're using a woven fabric because that's what I recommend all the time. And I don't actually know how to sew with knits very well myself personally. Um, so you're gonna need some ease in these pieces to fit that shirt underneath and to be able to move. So 13 inches around the top of my arm, I'm gonna go ahead and do that as 14 inches here when making my pattern. So I've gone seven inches out either side of my center line for a 14 inch across the top here. Then what I've done, this sleeve cap is not meant to be set into, you know, 
the arm side of the bodice. It's meant to be separate from it so that we have this area for the, the shirt to show through and puff out in like a cage of ribbon. So I don't need to make this a proper sleeve cap that fits in. It just needs to look and like vaguely remind us of the shape of a sleeve cap. So I'm pretty sure I just did this by trial and error. I took, you know, you can cut out this paper, tape it together and hold it on your arm and like slip your arm into it and see how high you want this to come. So I just went up three and a half inches from like kind of baseline here. This line kind of represents the line going underneath your arm here. So obviously you can't have three and a half inches all the way along because this is coming underneath your arm. So underneath your arm, you, your sleeve doesn't have to be as tall, but on the outside of the arm, I have it come up a little bit like as a faux sleeve cap situation. Hopefully you, this makes some sense. So I came up three and a half inches and I just drew that as a curve and eased it back down to where it began. So this is not like a special curve the way you would normally do a sleeve where it's like now do five eighths from here, now come down one eighth from here. If you've seen my sleeve drafting video, you know what I mean? Like there's very specific ways you draft a sleeve cap. This is just a curve because it's just meant to mimic a sleeve cap, not actually fit into the bodice. So I've just drawn on that curve three and a half inches up and then to find the end of the sleeve, I came down six inches from that initial line. Again, if we're looking at our measurements, this was six inches from like my kind of like, this is like, I guess bicep, top of bicep to near the top of my elbow. Again, you're gonna be trial and airing this. You might want them longer. You might want your sleeve section shorter. You might want different amount of segments. You might wanna have like six segments along this. You might wanna have just do one sleeve, which is completely different thing. So we're not going to do that today, but, but, um, to do this exact one that I always use, this is my process. Um, so again, I came down that six inches and then for this measurement above my elbow, it was 11 and a half. So again, I added one inch to that. So it was going to be 12 and a half. So I came out six and a quarter from each side. So it was 12 and a half down here, connected my end of my lines, added seam allowance. And that is the top sleeve pattern. Um, I don't need to do anything else to that. That one is done. Um, so for then for my lower sleeve here, same sort of idea, this measurement 10 and a half for the lower sleeve pattern, I'm going to use a added of half inch of ease as opposed to the full inch that I used for the top. So one, at, one inch of ease at the top, half inch for the bottom. Um, and again, it was supposed to be seven inches long this way. So again, I have it seven inches long. And then if you have just the straight sides like this, you connect those lines, just like we did up here, then it's just a straight sleeve, but let's be honest, I wanted to make it even, you know, swoopier and more epic. So I did these little kind of cutouts that are on the kind of underside of your forearm. If you've seen me try and show this in video, it's like kind of hard to show, like model this in a way that isn't ridiculous looking, but it looks really cool in person. So all I did to do that was just swoop these two um, bits out of the side. And if I were using this piece of paper, I would have to do the same over here. But the last, since I already have mine that I use all the time, I I'm not <laughs> continuing on here. This was just a demonstration for you guys, but I'm just going to use the same one as always. And in fact, luckily, uh, because I was going to make a different black one of these before, I actually already have my bottom sleeve sections because the rest of it didn't work out, but I still have these done and already made. So oh, I'm feeling really good about that because they are kind of a little bit annoying. Like if you imagine when you sew this, you're going to cut out one of your fabric, one of your lining, of course. And then you have to, uh, I usually start up here. You can see on this one, I start here, go around, sew everything like a pillow and then stop and then I'll slip stitch this shut. But when you turn this like right side out, you have to clip these corners completely, clip those off and then clip all along these curves so that you can turn it right side out and it looks smooth like this. So it is a little bit annoying, <laughs> but so that's why I'm really glad that I already have my lower sleeves ready to go for this project today. That's awesome. So hyped about that. The other thing I do is I just create this little lower uh, like extension over the hand just so this comes a little bit down over the hand a little bit more, I guess. And to do that, I just draw on the shape of what I want down over my hand, I guess. You could have like a classic like pointed princess shape that often you see in costumes and stuff like that too, where you just have this be a little bit more pointed. It's kind of a Sleeping Beauty-ish touch. That is also an option. But yeah, that basically that's how I draft these is just through measuring my arm in different places um, as opposed to a normal sleeve pattern, which is like much more geometry. Uh, but this is quite simple because I don't need it to fit exactly because, you know, it's just going to be these little bands basically that are held on with ribbon. 
um, it's less precious than you think it would have to be. So that is how I draft the sleeves for these Renaissance bodices. And hopefully you'll see a little bit more how this comes together as I sew this one and put everything together in the end. So this time I'm going to be making the bodice and upper sleeves of this out of a cotton twill. Um, the lower sleeves are cotton sateen. I'm going to decide that I don't care, I think. <laughs> um, I could make new lower sleeves out of the cotton twill as well. I certainly have enough fabric to do so, but I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm not going to bother. I'm going to use the cotton sateen ones. I think the black is a really similar color and you will know because now I've told you, but I think probably if you watch the lookbook the week uh, that came out the week before this video, um, you'll probably not have noticed that those were two different fabrics until now that I told you. So my lower sleeves will be cotton sateen, my upper and bodice will be cotton twill. Um, again, you can make this out of any fabric you want, but if you're going to use something a lighter weight, uh, probably, like don't use like chiffon or like uh, like a rayon crepe unless you're going to put like a heavy duty interfacing on the inside of that because you want this to be more structured fabric. Like I would recommend, I don't know, cotton velvet, cotton twills, uh, cotton canvas even, thicker linens would be really good. Linen is always a good historical kind of inspired fabric. Um, or even like corduroy, wool, I've made that, the Slytherin one is made out of wool. So more sturdier fabrics for something like this to create like a bodice, especially when you're not doing a lot of boning in it, you want the sturdiness of the fabric to help you with the shape there. And this bodice just ends here at the waist. So um, I wear it, you know, with a skirt underneath and it looks like a dress in the end, as long as the skirt matches. And I already have a cotton twill black black cotton twill pencil skirt made out of the same organic cotton twill from moodfabrics.com. I will actually link this fabric in the description below because it's one of my favorite fabrics from Mood. I've used it a ton. I've used the navy. I've used the red. I've used a lot of the black today, quite a lot. So I already have a pencil skirt made to match this. And so once I wear the bodice with the skirt, it will look like a dress, even though it is actually two separate pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this out of my fabric and get started. All right. So here I am cutting out those main bodice pieces and also the upper sleeve out of the black cotton twill I want to use for this project. I'm also going to cut um, all three of these out of some black cotton sateen that I have laying around to line this. Um, I would prefer to use something thinner, a actual lining fabric, but I just didn't have anything in stock right now and anything, uh, any fabric or anything I want to buy right now I would have to order online and therefore it would take a while to get to me. So black cotton sateen to line this it was um, a little bit thick for a lining fabric, but oh well. Um, so here I am just cutting these pieces out of the twill and then I'll cut them out of cotton sateen as well. So of course, once I have everything cut out, I need to transfer some marks from my pattern onto my pattern or my cut pieces here. So here I am transferring the notches that are on a princess seamed bodice of any kind, usually um, near the bust for both the center piece and the side front piece, there will be these notches that you have to match up. Um, I talk about this when I talk about drafting princess scene patterns in my other videos. So if you've listened to those videos before or watched those, then you should have heard me talk about these notches being important for easing that extra bust fullness into the center front piece before. And then for the backs here, I also just need to mark my darts, of course. So I'm going to go ahead and I've punched holes through my pattern so that I can transfer the dart points onto the back side of my fabric. Again, if you've been around here on the channel long, you know that I don't mind drawing on the inside of my garments. Again, this garment is going to be fully lined. No one will ever see all this marking I'm doing in colored pencil. Um, you could use a chalk pencil. You could use some sort of like um, erasable thing or uh, those markers that disappear or whatever. I just use colored pencil because I am not picky. And I'm just going to go ahead and pin my darts, making sure those are all matched up and set them next to the machine so I can go ahead and sew those. I'm also not surging any raw edges or anything for these pieces because of course it's all going to be lined. So here I am matching the center front piece on top of one of the side front pieces here in the twill. I'm just going to pin that notch first and then pin down to the waist. And then I will pin from the second notch up. So up here again, I'm matching those marks I transferred from my pattern so that everything stays where it needs to be. And then this area here, I need to ease into that curve of the bust. Of course, the center front piece here is quite straight and the bust is quite curved. So I'm just easing that into place and then I'm gonna use a lot of pins to keep everything where it needs to be and make sure this area doesn't get puckered or pleated or anything weird happens when I'm sewing it. And as we know here on this channel, and I have to kind of disclaimer it every time, yes, I do sew over my pins. Um, you know, some people were taught one way, some people were taught the other way. I don't run into much trouble doing it like so. Um, I know a lot of people say, oh, you're going to break 
needles and pins and stuff like that. It just doesn't happen very often for me, so I do sew over my pins. If this is majorly offensive to you, I apologize. So here I'm just sewing one of those princess seams. And then I will go ahead and sew my darts and all the back pieces. So again, I'm doing the twill and then also the same for the lining pieces that are identical. And I just tie my darts shut as you've seen me do here on the channel before. Of course, I do need to do the other side once I've done that first side for these front bodice sections. So here I am pinning again from the notch down to the waist and then pinning that other marking up above the bust and pinning that area and then easing that straight edge over the curved one. I like to pin from with a curved side down and then the straight piece on top like this just so I can ease it into where it needs to be. You can put tiny little like snip one uh, fourth of an inch into the seam on that straight piece if you really need to help to make it fit the curve. Um, I didn't need to with these ones, but sometimes I have in the past. All right, so after my darts are all sewn, my princess seams are all sewn, I can come over here and start pressing the darts down and everything, all the seams open. Um, because I am using a sateen to line this and it's a thicker fabric, I pressed, as you can see, it's very wrinkled sateen also from being in my stash here. Um, I'm pressing the darts in opposite directions. So on the outside fabric, the twill, the fashion fabric in this case, I'm pressing the darts in the direction I'm supposed to, which is towards the center. And then here on the lining, I'm pressing the darts toward the side seam just so that they are staggered because it's such a thick fabric to be using for lining. I'm just going to stagger the darts inside like that. Then here on my upper sleeves, I've sewn the underarm or like side seam of those shut on all four of these. Again, two twill, two sateen. I'm just going to press the seams open here. And then the next step for these upper sleeves is to turn the sateen right side out, as you can see, and then I'm going to put them right sides together inside the twill outer layer. And I'll just pin that all along the top edge here. So I'm basically going to be, you know, lining the upper sleeve by setting the lining inside. I'm sorry that the lining and the outside are such <laughs> similar fabrics here. It's really hard to tell the difference, but I basically have right sides together with the lining tucked inside and I'm just going to go ahead and pin all around the top here so that I can sew the lining and the fashion fabric together. So over here on the machine, again, sewing over my pins, um, with my usual half inch seam allowance, I'm just sewing around the top edge, sewing the sateen lining to the twill of the upper sleeves. And so I'm going to go ahead and clip all that curved area at the top of these I guess sleeve cap, sort of sleeve cap, you know, it's a faux sleeve cap, but I'm cutting out little triangles here. I am using these scissors, which are not ideal for this, but my main shears actually need to be sharpened. So these are actually a little bit easier and give me a little bit more control when doing something like this. Again, you're not clipping, you know, into the thread, you're clipping just above the thread of where that's sewn. And then you can pull these right sides out and tuck the lining down into the twill properly. So now that top edge is all encompassed together. I'm just going to go ahead and pin the bottom edge right here for now while I go ahead and turn everything nicely up at the top and actually pin it in place with some glass headed pins that I can then uh, press over. But I'm just going to zhuzh this seam around here. Um, that's why we clipped it inside so that this curve would be as nice as possible. The more clips you put, the nicer the curve is going to be, um, especially because it's not like the seam is going to get a lot of tension, so you can feel free to put clips in there. Also, I'm going to be clipping my curves on my princess seams here so I can press those open as well. So here, this is back on the bodice. I'm just going to press my princess seams open as well. Again, you have to clip those because of that curve and straight edge meeting. Always clip your curves. Sometimes I do go ahead and top stitch princess seams as well just to hold all this down and make everything lie super smooth. I didn't bother with this project. Just going through and pressing open my princess seams. Now I can go ahead and sew my side seams of both the fashion fabric and the lining. So I'm just lining those up here and pinning away, pinning my side seams together. Here's the lining sateen here. Just pinning everything like so. And then also on these little upper sleeves again. Now that the top is all ironed into place, I can go ahead and fold over both the fashion fabric and the lining edge at the bottom. And then I'm going to go ahead and hand slip stitch all this shut. Um, so the top seam I was able to do 
to line it with a machine stitch, but down here I'm just turning everything under that half inch of seam allowance, lining them up, and then I will slip stitch the lining and the fashion fabric together here at the like cuff of this piece, I suppose, of the upper sleeve. This is why I'm using glass headed pins um, for this so that I can go ahead and just iron over those without worrying about melting anything. And again, here I'm tucking the lining under the same way and then pinning the two together. If anything, you want the lining to be a little bit shorter uh, than the fashion fabric. Of course, you've only allowed the half inch of seam allowance in the pattern, so you don't want to go over that. Back over here on the machine, I jump around here. Sorry, I'm bad processing. Um, but back over at the machine, I'm just going to sew those side seams on the uh, machine here for the bodice and the bodice lining. Back on the ironing board, I've gone ahead and pressed those side seams, and then I'm laying the lining right side uh, on top of right side, laying the lining on top of the fashion fabric. And I'm gonna go ahead and sew everything except for the top of the straps, and then leave a little section blank in the center front as well, where it's straight um, open so that I can go ahead and line this whole thing, basically. So I'm pinning everything together and those darts are staggered in the back, like I mentioned when I was pressing them, um, and this back edge and everything here. I'm just sewing all the bodice and the bodice lining together, except for the top of the straps and then this center front area here. You can see me leave that blank there in the center front, just there, that blank spot you can see at the top of the screen here. That is where I'm leaving space for my hand to be able to get in and out of the garment when I am turning this all right sides out. This is exactly how I line vests as well, um, or anything I make that has straps. So I'm just leaving that like inch and a half, two inches available at the top of the straps for myself so I can show, sew the shoulders together separately. But I'll line the rest of it, this underarm area and all around the other edges all at once. Here at where the front meet, I did have to make another little snip into the seam allowance. Of course that won't be seen just so I can get around that corner and maneuver with my needle when I'm over on the machine. But here we go, just gonna pin this top front neckline edge and we're good to go. That's a lot of pins. All right, so I'm just sewing all those sections now. Here I'm sewing one of the underarms, but you just sew everywhere I just pinned, I'm gonna go ahead and sew together using a small stitch length, using my regular half inch seam allowance. But you see me here, I stop before the end of the strap because we're going to do some finagling up there. Here at the front neckline, I, once I get to that point where the straps meet the neck, I suppose, I leave the needle down like so, turn the project and keep going. Now I can go ahead and clip my curves again on all those different seams and anywhere there's a corner, I go ahead and clip the corner off, of course. Again, being careful not to clip into the seam you just put in, but you want to clip anything that's curved so that it will lie nicely when you turn all this right side out. All right, so now I do need to clip these corners again here in the top as well. So now I can go ahead and go into that opening that I had left myself and turn this all right side out. You can see that I have, while I was, before I did that step, I actually did put some interfacing along the inside of the back edges. I totally forgot to film any of that, um, but I just took a tiny bit of lightweight interfacing that I had uh, still here in this in the stash here. I'm out of most interfacings and um, but I had a little bit of fusible left and I just put a couple like uh, strips of it along the center back of this while it was still flat so that where I put the eyelets in, it has a little bit more strength. Um, I would have used more interfacing if I had it, but I just didn't even have it in stock. So I'm just turning everything right side out here and I'm going to go ahead and use a um, knitting needle that I keep over here now for this purpose because I got in trouble for using scissors here on this channel to poke my corners out. Um, but I just use this knitting needle to go ahead and finesse the corners of things, but since they're clipped, they should be no problem. This is where you'll run into a lot of problems if you haven't clipped your curves, etc. But I'm just using that knitting needle as a guide inside here to make sure everything is going to lay flat and smooth, and then you go around and press everything, basically, which, you know, isn't necessarily the most fun. But as I uh, say sometimes here on the channel, a lot of sewing is pressing. So if you don't like ironing, you know, it's a, it's one of the essential parts of this whole process. Okay, 
So here I'm going to go around and press everything. Also, I'm going to go ahead and stick some boning along the back edges here. I have some spring steel boning. I have some spiral steel boning because I took apart a ton of old corsets recently. So I have a ton sitting here. So I figured I would just use this spring steel here and slip that into the back edge. So I'm just going to slip that inside and then pin nearby with these glass headed pins again to keep it held in place. And then I will use the zipper foot on my machine to be able to get right close to that boning and stitch it down so that basically a little boning channel right along the back edge is created to hold this in place. This is just so that when I do lacing down the back that the um, bodice doesn't get all scrunched up. It's good to have some structure and boning here in the back. Again, it would be even better if I had more interfacing and really the nicest possible way to do lacing on something like this where I'm not wearing like any corsetry or something underneath it would be to do like a hidden zipper placket underneath so that it's zipped closed and really smooth and then laced over that would be really nice. Um, so I'll try and develop that for kind of the next time I do something like this with back lacing because it's hard to get everything to lay nice and smooth on yourself um, when you're dressing quickly by yourself for lookbooks uh, in my case. If you have a friend to help you keep your laces straight who knows what they're doing back there then you're much better off but I don't usually have a dresser when I'm doing my videos sadly enough. So I just sewed that line of stitching to hold the boning in place back there. And now I can go ahead and start finishing this off by sewing the straps together. So I'm going to sew the twills together up here for each arm, I guess. And then over on the machine, I can go ahead and sew those shoulder straps together. Sew the twill together here. Again, that's right sides together up there. This is why we left these all open because it'll be make it so that we can cleanly finish everything up here. And once I have the twill ones together, I can go ahead and sort of twist this and turn so that I can pin the right sides of the sateen together as well, like so. So while I'm up here, I'll just twist it so that I can pin the right sides of the sateen lining together. And I will stitch those shut as well. Again, I do show this same method of doing a strapped fully lined garment like this in my vest video if you're interested in watching with a bit less murky fabric because all in black here it's a little hard to see what's going on. Okay, take those pins out. So when you get back over to the pressing table, if you just pull on those, it should work out like this. So you have a finished seam on the outside and on the inside. Um, they are a little bit hard to press at this point, but you know, get in there and try and press those seams open anyway. And then with these two sides still open, you can finish one side of this by machine. So I usually choose the more curved side, um, which in this case is my neckline. So I've turned both of those through the opening on the like shoulder arm side. And that way I can pin those together at the shoulder seam here and close up that side there. And then I'll just have the last side the opening that I've pulled this through currently to slip stitch shut by hand. Hopefully this makes sense. Uh, this is how a lot of strapped dresses and things like that are made. If you follow along with like simplicity or butterick patterns and stuff like that, I think they usually show you how to do it this way. Um, but after you sew that, so then one side is all finished there. Oh, actually I showed, I sewed the shoulder side done and then I'm hand stitching the neckline side. I can't remember this was days ago, um, but same on the other side. I'm just pinning the neckline side of that shut finely, and I'll just slip stitch that small area there shut. But it allows you to machine stitch everything else if you do it this way. And then of course I have that opening at the bottom of the center front, which again, I will slip stitch by hand shut as well. So now I have all my stitching set aside, the tops of those, or the bottom hems of those upper sleeves, and those two areas I just pinned over on the ironing table. So I came over here to do all my hand stitching at once. I like to batch process. All right, so after hand stitching this little last section along the like straps-ish, <laughs> the shoulders up here and that center front piece together, the last thing to do for the main body of the vest is to do the grommets down the back. You could do hand sewn eyelets for this as well. I'm just gonna go ahead and use grommets because it's much faster and this is just a costume kind of, costumey kind of wearable piece, not <laughs> neither an actual costume, historic costume, or, you know, anything like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and use metal, uh, like eyelid grommet situation over here. And the way I do that is I just went ahead and marked every inch and a half. Um, I don't have this done for spiral lacing. I just have it for crisscross lacing because, again, it's kind of costumey. That's what we're going for. 
Um, so I just marked those an inch and a half apart with my ruler here. And then I will go ahead and take an awl, like so, and I will punch through these areas. Actually, I want to find my bigger awl because I have another one somewhere that's um, larger. So I can poke these through and use a grommet press or a eyelet press to press these in place. And that little machine just looks like this. So the grommets uh, go into here, the larger piece goes on the top, the small little washer goes on the bottom, and then you just press this down. Obviously you hold the garment in between, hold that area where I will punch, well not punch, you can punch the hole out, but I usually use an awl to push the fibers out of the way. Um, I try to break as few fibers as possible when doing this, but of course with a tightly woven fabric it isn't always possible to push them all aside. Um, but I hold this, you know, the area where I want the garment to be in between there, and then you kind of press on this. Um, I do this on the floor and use like all of my leverage on this, um, but this is just a grommet press. They're available online. That's where I got this one ages and ages ago, back when I used to make corsets. Okay, so I have my grommets all in along the back here, and I just crisscross laced it with some thin black ribbon. That's really all I have in stock right now. Um, so that will work for now at least. Um, I might want to like replace it with like a cotton cord or something sometime, but that will do. But the next thing I have to do is attach the sleeves here. Um, so I'll just go ahead and talk you through that. So this here is the bodice of this same style that I made for Gryffindor, of course. Um, the only difference here is that instead of wearing this over a separate blouse, I did just sew little linen sleeves into the arm side of this, uh, just because I didn't have time to make a whole separate blouse. So I just put a little sleeve in here, which, uh, you know, unfortunately means I can't wear this one with different colored shirts. Um, but it was what I had to do at the time. But I just pull these uh, out every time, one of these, and measure where I need to put the ribbon straps on. Um, so this is the first time I ever did it this way, where I had, because usually I just put velvet ribbon from here to the next section. But this one I decided to continue the velvet ribbon all the way along the upper arm. And I actually quite like how that looks, so I'm going to do that again for the black one here. So um, I figured out how long these you know sections needed to be by trial and error. So I tried this on over the shirt I was wearing, or with one with sleeves like this, and I just slid these on onto my arm and kind of held them up where I wanted it to and uh, pinned the ribbons in place. So it's best to, like the first time you're doing this, uh, because this is the, I don't know, maybe like eighth version of this kind of Renaissance inspired same kind of sleeves situation like this. So usually, you know, I've been measuring them for years, just measuring the one I made before to make the next one. So I haven't had to actually figure out how long these things need to be in a while. But if you take a piece of ribbon, if you're using velvet ribbon like me, whatever you're using, ribbon, tape, whatever, um, and sew it to the center. You can see how this is centered on the shoulder seam up here um, and let, let that let that hang free. Then you put this on and you slide the sleeves up over onto your arm and kind of decide how far you want it, pin that, then take the sleeve off and you can measure that and do the same for the other side there. Hopefully this makes some sense. I'm having some trouble arranging my brain today. Um, but hopefully you get what I mean. Like you slide these sections onto your arm and measure how long you want your ribbons to be. There's not an exact science to this. Um, it's just kind of like try it on and see what you like, pin what you pin when you like what you see, slide everything back off and then just replicate whatever you end up doing on one side to the other side, of course. Um, so I'm probably gonna do this same kind of arrangement of ribbon for this black one, like I said. So I'm gonna do the center. This ends up on the center of the shoulder line and also on the center of these. So if you imagine you know, this is the center of this. So you attach the ribbon here or from the top of the shoulder line along here and then all the way down if you want. Um, I'm gonna see how much ribbon I have. I don't have a ton again in stock here in lockdown. So um, I'll see if I have enough to do it this way. And if I do, I will go ahead and do so. I'm, I mean, I would love to have this ribbon even come down to here as well. So I'll have to see if I can do that. Um, but for me, this is, um. On the sleeve portion here, upper sleeve, this is about two and three fourths of an inch away from each other. This is about three and uh, three fourths. <laughs> Again, you can see how well my brain's working today. Three and three fourths down from the center one is where this one starts. Um, and this is four and a quarter in from this point to where this ribbon goes. Um, so those are just some rough measurements. Again, it's going to be different for anyone. It's going to be different depending on the look you want. You can do a lot of ribbons connecting it and have this be much more of a cage effect if you wanted to. Um, 
you don't have to use ribbon you can use again ties like uh, sew a ribbon here and here and have it be long and then tie them in bows um, to tie the sleeves on if you want to you could put grommets here and here and loop a ribbon through and tie bows that way um, or again do like hooks you could do um, anything you want really you know get creative with it expand if you should so desire but I'm just gonna do velvet ribbons extremely similar to the Gryffindor one here on this black version you can see I've already started a little bit so I sewed little loops of elastic and I instead of setting them so that they're sewn into this point I like to sew them on separately afterwards like this in case I ever do decide to switch this to ribbons or something like that I want to be able to take this elastic off um, and this is the elastic is the easiest way to be able to get these sleeves on um, I'll maybe I'll try and show you that in the modeling clip for this one and then I just sewed buttons to the other side so that you know when this is being worn you can just loop the elastic Whoop. everything harder to do with one hand over like that and then it gives you some mobility uh, with that elastic so you can stretch your arm or move around a little bit too um, and then it's just easier to put on than trying to tie bows on your own arms um, so just loops around buttons is how I do that and I saw the buttons kind of like on top of the points there it doesn't have to be perfect yeah it just has to work so I'm gonna go ahead and cut my ribbons and then hand stitch them on to my sleeve bits so this is after I've pinned the strips along here these are the correct length with a little bit folded over so that I can go ahead and tack them on to the top of the shoulder like this one is done along here or along the arm area of the bodice um, and then I've left these just a little bit longer than I'm going to need them so that I can measure and attach them to the lower sleeve separately um, but I am going to actually go ahead because I'm doing these long strips instead of just doing small ones um, I'm going to go ahead and machine stitch these down just right along the edge in the velvet um, on both sides on this side and on this side for each of these strips here so then my upper sleeves will be ready to attach to my lower sleeves and attach to the bodice so to do that, um, you see me here uh, having a really fun time sewing this ribbon onto the sleeves that are already constructed. You can do this while they're flat still. Um, it's just other things that are kind of annoying. It, you just choose which annoying way to sew things you would like. So I just sew them halfway down from the top and then flip it and go the other half of the way from the bottom. Um, and that worked for me. I mean, it's not the most elegant way of doing this kind of thing, but I never really decide what I want to do with the ribbons until I get to this point in the process, so whatever. Um, but after this, all I had to do was clip all of my loose threads and then stitch these on to the bodice where they belong, the little ribbons, and stitch those onto the bodice by hand and stitch them onto the lower sleeves by hand as well. So I didn't actually remember to film that, but just imagine me sewing the ribbon down onto the bodice where it needs to go, basically. And then I am going to include here at the end of this video how I make the sort of peasanty blouses I wear underneath something like this, or to wear under something like this, or to wear separately, or to do any swashbuckling you may need to do. Um, I filmed most of making one of these blouses, and then I lost some of my footage, and then I since lost the pattern as well. So we have some old footage here, we have some new footage here. It's going to be a compilation, but hopefully you get the idea of how I make these peasant blouses. All right, so I have need for a couple of sort of your standard renaissance pirate costumey billowy 18th century vampire etc riding habit what have you billowy bishop blouse or billowy peasanty blouse pirate blouse what have you um so i need to make one in a uh, creamy colored of ivory and then i also have a kind of golden goldenrod yellow cotton gauze to make one out of um, i just need a couple more of these in rotation for some upcoming lookbooks I have planned. So I need to make a couple of peasant blouses. However, luckily this is the easiest style thing to make ever. Um, anyone can do this. You don't need a basic block to do this. You don't need a ton of pattern drafting or even sewing experience to be able to make a blouse like this. This is a pretty good beginner project and it's pretty hard to get the sizing wrong as long as you are um, erring on the side of too much gathering, which in this case is fine. Um, so. As you can see here, most of this is covered up by a cute little vest here, but the big billowy sleeves are really what we're, we're after in this life, isn't it? But a big peasanty piratey blouse is super easy to make. So obviously once it's tucked in, the drawstrings are drawn, etc. It kind of looks like this, but in general, it's actually a very flat and geometric shaped thing. You can sometimes see peasant blouses um, also done with a raglan style sleeve. I'm just going to do it with a kind of boxy style. 
uh, myself. You can do these in many different ways. This is just how I do them. Um, there's many different options and more experienced seamstresses can play along with these and finesse them. But if you want a good beginner project, this might just be it because it is really almost like four rectangles. So the main body of this peasanty blouse is a big rectangle and you're going to want to make that rectangle at least, you know, four plus inches bigger than your widest measurement. So either whatever your widest measurement across your torso is, um, your bust or your waist or what have you, your shoulder even, whatever your widest measurement across you is, you want to make this that plus at least four to, I don't know, 10 inches of each. So for example, my bust measurement is 42 and my waist is 30. So this will fit no matter what we do up here, um, or at least it will be swamped by, which is exactly what we want in this case. Um, so my bust measurement is 42. And I'm going to make my entire pattern 26 inches across um, on the front, which means that in total, of course, it will be 52 inches wide, which is, of course, 10 inches larger than my bust measurement. So it's 10 inches of ease around the center of my body here um, that will become gathering by either wearing a belt or tucking this in. Or you could put an additional drawstring in like at waist level of this. I don't usually bother because everything I wear is high waisted. So um, that kind of provides a drawstring in a way for me. Um, and then of course we have the drawstring up in the neckline to contain the rest of that gathering, which is of course mostly across the center of the body. So we have a rectangle that I'm going to have be 26 inches wide in my case, add as much or as little gathering uh, as you want basically. So as long as you have at least, I would say at the very minimum four inches of ease, at the maximum probably like 15 inches of ease um, around your body, maybe 20. You can, you can go pretty far as long as you have a like thin, like um, drapey fabric. Like if you were doing this in like a chiffon, you could go quite wild and have it be as full as you wanted really. Um, so I'm gonna make mine again, 26 inches across my pattern um, because the front and back are going to be the same. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Front and back are gonna be the same here. So this is what the pattern looks like for the front and the back. 26 inches across, I'm gonna make mine 23 inches long. Um, the sleeves, where they attach onto this main body here, it's gonna be an 11 in inch depth. Usually like my arm side curve on my pattern pieces is around nine and a half inches. So I'm just adding a little bit of extra onto that. So if you wanna measure your arm side of a pattern that you know you like the fit of, we're gonna drop that a little bit lower. It's gonna be a little bit of a looser, more, you know, like swashbuckling movement kind of a situation. So I'm gonna make a mark on my pattern 11 inches down from the shoulder. And that's just where my sleeve will attach to this. But of course it's a straight seam. So there's no like setting in the sleeve. We're gonna do this all top down and very flat and you'll see in the sewing portion of this. So I'm just going to put an indication down the side at 11 inches down from the shoulder. The shoulders I'm finding because I'm just gonna come in four inches on either side and four and a half inches down. So over here on my pattern, you can see what that looks like. Again, whoop, I'm running into things. Big rectangle, 26 inches this way, 23 inches this way, plus seam allowance. And then I have come in four inches from either side and four and a half inches down. And then all I did, um, that's where this meets there. I just rounded this neckline here. I haven't added seam allowance to the neckline because I will be finishing this with a bias tape, a double fold bias tape to create a drawstring around the neckline. Um, but most of the like extra width is here in the center because of this, like my shoulder is about four inches. So most of like the extra width that gets gathered into this style is across the center front and center back, which is just how I like it. Um, so that's like the main body of the thing. Basically it's just a rectangle, you know, however long you want your shirt to be. If you wanted to make this a shift, like a dress length, and then like wear it belted and have a very like peasanty little dress, you totally could. Um, or you can make this a crop top if you want to, whatever you would like, you know. Uh, I'm just gonna make it 23 inches. That comes like to about mid hip on me. Um, and yeah, you could lower the neckline if you wanted to. You could make this rounder if you want. I try and keep it a little bit square just because I like to have a straight line across like when I'm wearing a vest or something over the top of this or like a little corset thing. Um, I like to have more of a straight line at the center front like that as opposed to curved or V'd or anything, but you can do whatever you want with the neckline as well. But this is just the most basic kind of version of this situation. Um, of course, these, this is gonna get sewn together at the shoulder seams. So that's what that, this is what that looks like flat. If you have a big piece of fabric, feel free to go ahead and cut this out without shoulder seams. Just, you know, have uh, two of these, one and two, and use this as like on the fold, basically, um, and eliminate that shoulder seam if you want. I don't really see a need to do so. Um, it's fine. Um, and now 
we have the front and back like so. They are identical, but how are we gonna put this sleeve on? So we have our markers 11 inches down from the shoulder. And what we're gonna do is sew on flat the sleeves like this. So this is the front and back. I'm gonna slow, so before I sew the side seams or anything, I'm gonna sew the sleeves on to the shoulder. So I just center the sleeve on the shoulder seam of this and it comes down 11 inches on either side and that gets closed. Now, this is where we are defining the front and back of this because until now, they have been identical, but the sleeves do have a front and a back, and I will cover that more when I tell you about how I drafted the sleeve pattern for this, um, which in general kind of looks like this. It's a big rectangle, and then I just split and flared it just a little bit, and I added a little bit of an extension along the bottom for a bit more poof because I've got to have poofy sleeves. Another little bit of extension for a little flared flouncy cuff on there, and yes, you could add, you know, lace if you wanted to, and why not? Um, oh, my computer says I have an email. Fun. Um, I don't currently have any lace or anything in stock, so I won't be trimming mine in any way. Maybe I'll make a big, floofy, like, black Swiss dot and lace cover one of these sometime. It'd be really fun. Um, but then the hemline of this dips a little bit lower in the back and comes up a tiny bit in the front, and that just allows the sleeve to have a very good, like, billowy drop in the back half of the sleeve. But I will show you all of that, or you will see how it comes together, basically. But that's generally how I make a peasanty blouse. Fast, you know, quick quick and dirty peasanty, piratey, you know, any, anywhere from like a quick renaissance sort of themed costume, musketeer. Uh, this works for a lot of different sort of looks. And having like a white or beige one of these in your like kind of semi-costume closet or like cosplay closet, will really come in handy for different characters over time if you want to do something with, you know, if you want to wear a piratey outfit one day, having this on hand, um, and it will also work for like a Renaissance outfit or a Three Musketeers kind of outfit or all kinds of stuff, or a 1940s inspired version of any of those things, which of course here on this channel is what I'm all about. So I have my front and back pattern here. I'm just going to use that. I'll cut two of these, obviously one for the front and one for the back. Um, and then I have my sleeve pattern as well. Editing Bianca here. Um, unfortunately, I deleted the footage for how to draft the sleeve for this, and then I also have since lost the pattern for this blouse. Don't know how that happened, but I've spent over an hour looking for it, and uh, I'm kind of over it now. So, for the sleeve pattern for this, I'm going to talk you through it. It's, again, super easy, just using the same kind of um, base of, you know, guess measurement, and then go from there. So, for our sleeve drop, I decided to use 11 inches, um, as I explained. And so to draft the basic sleeve, it's going to go on top of this. Again, it's going to look, you know, quite square. So draw a rectangle, uh, or like square off a line and draw a rectangle that is 11 inches for the front and 11 inches for the back. So you want, if you're using 11 inches like I am, um, for that drop, you're going to want to have a sleeve that is twice that. So 22 inches across a rectangle and then the length is going to be the length of your arm. Um, I think my arm is 24 inches long, something like that. So um, 22 by 24, a big rectangle, nearly a square in my case. Um, and like that center line is representing like the shoulder that'll be like sewn along here. It's like where that center line will be eventually. will be lined up with this if you were to cut this in two pieces, but there's no reason to. Um, so you're just basically drawing a rectangle that is 22 at 11 times 2 by the length of your arm. And then what I did is I split the front and the back, split that 11, um, and put in a line down each side. I'm sorry if I'm explaining this really badly. I'm still extremely <laughs> angry about not being able to find this pattern. Um, so 11, 11, and then split those in two, put lines there, and then you're going to cut up that center line and up those two other lines that you draw in between. Again, just split that difference there, five and a half. Um, cut all the way up to this point, but not through it, just like we do when we're slashing and spreading all the time. And so you'll have these like into strips and you can split that open as wide as you want to add width to the sleeve. For this, um, in the center, I only added an inch and a half. In the front, I added an inch and a half. In the back, I added around like three inches or so. I can't exactly remember. If I had the pattern here, I would show you the pattern instead of talking you through it, but Again, it disappeared. So um, three inches in the back. So you just use those splits to open up the sleeve and you're gonna add a little bit more in the back half than you do to the front. Um, but again, you wanna add extra width just so you can have a big billowy bishop sleeve. So once you have filled in these areas with paper and taped it all down, you should have you know a big kind of trapezoid shaped thing. You're gonna add, this is again the back half of the sleeve. So from like where this wedge is down, 
maybe like two or three inches, just add on a curve and curve it up to the side seam or the underarm seam of the sleeve. Curve down and then back up. Um, you just want the back of the sleeve to be a bit longer. That again creates enough poof and like billowiness in the back of the sleeve. Um, so after I've done like redrawn this curve basically, then I added on a two inch extension down here just for the like cuff on the sleeve. So I added on an additional two inches along that new curved hem and that was my sleeve pattern. Lord, do I wish I knew where it was because I actually rather liked how this blouse came out. So it's a major bummer that apparently the pattern has gone completely missing. And funny enough, my sleeve pattern is nearly as big as my front and back, if not larger, but this this is all about the sleeves. I mean, who are we kidding? Most of the rest of this is gonna be hidden most of the time I wear it um, because I'm mostly planning on wearing this with vests for kind of an 18th century or 19th century sort of look or um, with like little lacing uh, bodices, kind of like a more Renaissance or even like Oktoberfest sort of look. So, or Durndal kind of inspired look. So having big sleeves is what the nature of the game is all about here. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut my front and backs and my sleeves, two of each of these pieces out. So here I'm gonna start sewing this blouse together. I have sewn just the shoulder seams together so far. And of course I've served some of the raw edges here. Um, so I've just cut those shoulder seams together and now I can sew the sleeves on while everything is still flat. So I'm gonna take one of my sleeves here and I have a pin in the center. And so I'm going to go ahead and line that up right sides together with my shoulder seam. And I can go ahead boop, and stitch this on along here. Um, I actually usually, when I'm doing things where both sides look very similar, I have a pin to indicate that this is the front half of the sleeve. So this will now be the front of the bodice or the blouse. Um, beforehand, of course, both they're both the same. So the front and back are identical but not the same, um, they aren't identical on the sleeve. Ooh, man, I cannot talk tonight, goodness. Um, so I wanna make sure that the front is on this side and when I pin the other one, the front is also on that side so that that will then be the front of the blouse and this will be the back of the blouse. But I can go ahead and do this same thing on both sides and sew the sleeves on as they are flat. So there's no setting in sleeves, there's just sewing on sleeves really with this project. All right, so sleeves are sewn on Fronts are both here in the front, and we have this big, you know, kind of cross shape situation. So now to sew the underarm seam and the side seam, flip it up. Here, I'll show you. Ooh, I'm just trying to <laughs> show how that goes. So then we can sew them like this. So again, I did not film the complete construction and what of what I did mostly was lost. So I was talking you through what else I did on this blouse. Um, so again, I sewed the sleeves onto the body while this was flat, and then I sewed the underarm seam of the sleeve and side seam all in, at once. I just turned up the bottom hem a couple of times and sewed that down with the machine stitching. Um, this is the inside here. And then to finish the neckline, I made bias tape out of the same fabric here, uh, double fold bias tape, and I just um, encase the neckline, the raw edge of the neckline in that bias tape um, to create a little drawstring to put a ribbon through so that this can be, of course, used as a drawstring. So that's how I finished the neckline of this. And then for the sleeves, on the outside of the sleeve here, bias tape around, like it would be a, on the pattern. If you imagine this first curve line, I marked that with pins on the piece of fabric and I pinned bias tape all along that and then I sewed it along the top and the bottom to create another drawstring around the edge of the sleeve. Again, I did not do that straight across the sleeve. I followed this curve because I want this extra billowiness in the back um, as part of this. So I followed the curve with the bias tape and that's where the drawstring went. And then again, for the hem on the sleeve, I just used a thinner bias tape to finish that this time. Um, I wish I had more clips of me sewing this for you. I'll do a separate peasanty blouse video sometime in the future, especially since I apparently need to remake my pattern all over again since it has gone completely missing.
So here you can see me with the vest bodice situation mostly on. And I'm just going and trying to close the last of the sleeve section here. You can see even with the elastic on this, this is not the easiest to do by yourself, especially when you have such a puffy blouse on underneath. And this is a very puffy blouse that I have on here. But eventually I do get the loops of elastic around those buttons so that those are closed. And you kind of just play with the fullness of the sleeve and pull it and pull and pinch it out where you want it basically until it looks how you would like. And this is the finished ensemble, the little vest and sleeve and peasant blouse, and then worn with a pencil skirt that matches. So it ends up looking quite a lot like a dress. Obviously done in more sumptuous materials, this would look more like those costumes from the Borgia's TV show, but I just wanted to have something a little bit more practical and things that I could eventually, especially in this all black version, wear different colors of blouse underneath in the future. Again, not that I don't, I don't know where I'm going in this outfit, particularly because there's not a lot of castles to visit around here or Renaissance fairs that don't abuse animals that I could visit. But, you know, maybe in the future there will be cruelty-free Renaissance festivals where one can watch as it joust or something like that. I don't know, in full, weirdly combining, combining Renaissance and 50s style. These are kind of an odd garment, but they're just very fun to wear. Uh, they're good for like a Christmas party, actually, because it's kind of like a magical situation. I hope those of you who have been curious about how I make these, I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any further questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I will hopefully be able to get back to you and solve any quandaries you may have. As usual, thank you all for tuning in here with me today. I hope this was a nice sewing break, I suppose, and uh, stay safe out there. I'll see you again soon. Bye. And before anyone asks, this eyeshadow is from JD Glow Cosmetics. It's one of their multi-chromes. They only have a few, but uh, if they're all as potent as this one, then I would think that they're all worth the investment. Um, Multichromes tend to be a little bit more expensive, but they're actually, their shimmers and everything are quite a large pan size and a very reasonable price. And they're the best glittery shimmer eyeshadows I've ever used. So make sure you check out JD Glow Cosmetics if you haven't um, looked at them before. I've been meaning to make a video on them for forever on my beauty channel, but we all know I never get around to making beauty channel videos now, do I? But um, I just knew that if I wore this one today, I was gonna get questions about it. So JD Glow Cosmetics Multichromes, they're super fun.